you would go back to your hotel room exhausted, beat up, fake blood all over you. So I get asked a lot about how I got into this and really it's a matter of just loving movies and loving monsters. When I was little, my dad was in the film industry, he was a post-production sound editor, and he was a huge cinephile. And my mother was an artist, so that was in my blood as well. So combined, I had to do something creative in the film industry. And going with my dad to the movie studios when I was a kid was something really special and made me dream that maybe I'll walk around these, this studio lot working here. My parents were super supportive, and they certainly encouraged all my craziness in terms of, you know, teaching myself how to sculpt and paint and drawing monsters on everything. Like, I don't think there was any homework in, in school that was handed in that didn't have monster drawings all over it. And I started with doing masks. That was my number one thing. Like, I, I would draw up a bunch of different looking masks and then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do that one first and then that one and that one. And I started with just like a small little half face on a face cast I did on myself when I was probably 11 years old using alginate and plaster bandage. And I sculpted a Hulk, an Incredible Hulk mask in latex and molded it and ran it and painted it. And that was my very first mask. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I kept sculpting more and more and more. And it was nonstop. And I could make monsters all day long in my bedroom, which was really, really great. Growing up, there wasn't the internet. So I couldn't go online or go to YouTube and like look at tutorials. The two books that were really influential to me were Mike Westmore's Theatrical Makeup Techniques, which is, it's a paperback book. I still have my original one and it's great. And it, it really walks you through every process there is and how to do it. It's very elementary, but it was amazingly resourceful. And then the other book I really loved was Making a Monster, which was really influential to me. And each chapter featured a makeup artist. You know, you have Cecil Holland, you had Dick Smith, you had Rick Baker, you had Tom Berman, John Chambers, all the people that I loved so much. And I carried that book around me forever, like literally had it in my backpack and I would always read it. You know, if I was at school and I had downtime or whatever, it was lunch or recess, I would read the book. And then magazine wise, Famous Monsters of Filmland was huge for me. And then when Fangoria came out, that was off the charts. And I think the first issue I bought was the one that had Baker's Half Dozen in it, which was about Rick Baker and his team of makeup people and artists that worked at Rick Baker's EFX Studios. And there was like Tom Hester and Steve Johnson and Kevin Brennan and Sean McEnroe and Bill Sturgeon. And, and that was something I just poured over. And again, I still have my original copy. I cherish it. Right before I started working for Stan Winston, I got hired by John Carl Beekler. And I was, uh, I think, just turned 18 years old. And it was a good starting environment because John really let you get away with doing whatever you wanted, even though I didn't know what I was doing. But I appreciated that. You know, we worked on a bunch of different things. Like I think when I first started there, I caught the tail end of Ghoulies. And then I worked on Troll and Eliminators and the Ronnie James Dio video, Last in Line, that was directed by Don Coscarelli. That was very exciting because that was my very first like set experience, but just all of us doing makeups after makeups after makeups. It was really, really fun. You certainly learn what to do and what not to do at John's. And if you make a mistake, you find a way to remedy it. And I liked that lesson a lot. It wasn't about, you know, whose fault it is or, blaming somebody or blaming yourself. It was really about finding a solution because John just kind of let you figure stuff out. You know, it was like, well, we're going to solve it this way or that way. It's like, well, I just messed this mold up. What do I do? And then you figure out how to fix the mold so you can get the piece out and so forth. So it was a great experience. I, l I really enjoyed working at John's. So one of my big dreams was to work for Stan Winston. His studio was down the street from where I lived in Northridge, California. And this is before Stan did anything huge, but I knew who Stan and Winston was because that year Star Wars had come out and Stan had done the Star Wars Christmas special. And I'm like, oh my goodness, he did the Christmas special. It's so great. So I was able to find his phone number in the Yellow Pages, which is a book that probably doesn't really exist anymore. And I called and I said, hi, my name's Howard Berger. Big fan. Stan invited me over and I packed up all my stuff in a box and I walked about two and a half miles. And so I would go visit Stan, I'd have to show him my report card. And if it was A's and B's, I could go into the shop and hang out and visit. I graduated, I did a little time at Beekler's, and then I went over to Stan's, and Stan hired me. And there I got to work on Aliens, Invaders from Mars, Pumpkinhead, Predator, um, Monster Squad. It was great. I loved working at Stan Winston. Stan was the kindest person. 
And the things I really loved about Stan was um, he really knew how to sell our goods and sell it so that we weren't vendors, we were part of the creative team. And I think that's what's really important. Something we stress at K&B that myself and Greg Nicotero stress all the time. I'm a huge fan of movies from the 60s and 70s. I think that's when some of the best movies were made. Phoenix. And then, you know, through the years, the 80s have some great stuff. And, you know, maybe more films were more effects driven, you know, especially all the horror stuff, you know, be it Freddy or Jason or Leatherface or Pinhead. Those movies are all geared towards makeup effects. You know, it's like, okay, well, we know we have all these gags and now let's write them into a film. And that's kind of fun for those sort of films. We all stayed super busy and it was, you know, a badge of honor to work on a Freddy Krueger movie. But, you know, now as things have changed and, and I think there's, there's fewer people in charge who understand anything about filmmaking, that we're now at a point where uh, it's become more difficult and I think we're just so sensitive about everything these days. Our um, artistic uh, senses are extremely limited in what we can do and what we can't do. Yeah, you know, it's great. We've been very lucky at K&B where we've worked with a lot of directors over and over and over again. We did a lot of Wes Craven movies. We did a lot of films with Sam Raimi, a lot of films with Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez. It's great because you end up having a shorthand, you know, you, you both speak the same language, you know, which is really, really great. I work a lot with a director named Pete Berg and he's great. Pete did Deepwater Horizon and Lone Survivor, Patriot's Day, a lot of different things. And I have a shorthand with Pete, you know, and he trusts me. I get kind of a flavor of what he wants and then he lets me go. It's a tremendous amount of freedom. Sam Raimi um, is very specific and he, knows what he wants. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get there, but you do test after test after test until boom, you hit it. And he's like, that's it. That's exactly what I wanted. The films I oversaw with Quentin, I loved working on more than anything, which was like mostly Kill Bill 1 and 2, which was one of my most favorite films to ever work on. And Quentin would drag the best out of you and you would go back to your hotel room, exhausted, beat up, fake blood all over you but you felt so great because you, you really felt like you were part of the team and you did the best work you possibly could that day. So when you are hired to do something that is very well known and people all over the world for generations and generations love it, there's a little bit of pressure. It was one of the biggest shows we'd ever done at KNB, the biggest show I have ever done. And the pressure was that, you know, this is a well-established, you know, literature. And now we're gonna take characters and and realize them for this big giant movie. And granted, there had been versions prior, but this movie had to be great. And the pressure was on. And luckily on that show, we had like eight months, nine months of pre-production. So we could design and design and figure out and do tons of test makeups. And we worked really closely with Andrew Adamson, who was our director. And he would come in once a week and look at everything and, you know, give us our, his notes and how the Mr. Tumnus makeups were coming along or how the Manators were looking. It was really a magnificent experience, you know? And you're working with a giant crew. I think at that point, we had like 120 people working at k and but a handful of us, about 10 of us, went to New Zealand for the next eight, nine months and shot this movie. And it really was spectacular. It's definitely my most favorite film experience of my entire life. And it was really the first time I had worked so closely and so hand in hand with the visual effects department. And it was a great experience because that was the beginning of what we do now. We work hand in hand with visual effects. I will see movies that I work on and I'm always thinking about, well, oh, that day we did that, oh, that day we did that. But Chronicles of Narnia was probably the, one of the first movies I sat and I was really engrossed in and, and never thought about it, never thought about the making of. And I, I just, I loved it. And the Oscar goes to Howard Berger and Tammy Lane for the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, The Witch, and The Warrior. This is the first Oscar and nomination for Howard Berger and Tammy Lane. The gravy of it all is, is that you then start getting some recognition from your peers, and which is always lovely. 
and then you end up getting nominated for an Academy Award, for a BAFTA, for a Saturn Award, and then it's really wonderful when you win them too. But I don't take it for granted by any means. It's like, it was great winning an Academy Award with Tammy Lane, but the next day we had to go to work. So, you know, it's like, okay, this is a great night. Thank you very much. And like, all right, Tam, we got to go to set. Get up, it's five o'clock, we got to go to set. And if other things happen, then that's, like I said, just gravy. And to say thank, thank you, you so much and move on from there. You know, Greg Nicotero and I started KNB 35 years ago. We started it in 1988, in February. And it started really small and then got a little bigger, then got a bigger. Now it's massive after 35 years. But we love to be challenged. Every season on Walking Dead, Greg Reeve thinks all the stuff, you know, all the makeups. And it'd be easy for us to just keep reusing the same molds over and over again, but we don't. We always reinvent the wheel. And I think that's really great. And that, that keeps the guys enthusiastic and, and busy. And, and we get to come up with some really cool concepts, you know, for whatever show, you know, be it Orville, you know, I don't use the same makeups from Orville season one on Orville season three. I'm like, I wanna redesign stuff. You know, you have filmmakers like Seth MacFarlane who, who opened the door and was like, you know, this is my universe, go ahead and figure it out. And it's, it's really, really wonderful. Things I loved when I was a kid, I still really, really love. And I'm still a giant Stan Winston fan. I'm still a giant Rick Baker fan, Rob Bottin, Greg Canham. Dick Smith, of course, and that's what keeps me really enthusiastic. And I think most of the people in our industry are that way, that we, we thrive on things that we grew up loving. You know, my office at K&B, it's just filled with cool stuff, filled with monsters and masks and photos and books. And it's great because I look at every day I go into my office and I'm like, this is what I have always wanted. This is what I want when I was a little kid. I mean, I wish I could have that as a little kid, but now I'm a big little kid and I get to have all that cool stuff.